In this next module, I'm going to talk about the reproducible research movement. The reproducible research movement is uh, this idea that's been really talked about a lot in the last couple of years. And what do we mean by reproducible research? The, the title's actually a little, a little bit misleading because it's not talking about actually independently reproducing a research finding. That's a whole other level. All we're talking about for reproducible research in this context is that a reproducible paper is a paper where somebody else can take the data that was used in that paper and the analysis code, that the code that was used to analyze the data, and rerun that code on that data and actually generate tables and figures that match the tables and figures in the original paper. And you might think that that sounds like a pretty low bar, that that's a pretty trivial thing, right? Shouldn't, uh, if we've, you know, if it's a table and a figure in a published paper, shouldn't it be fairly easy to, to, to replicate it with the same code and the same data? In fact, it turns out that it's not such a trivial thing. Um, we're dealing these days with a lot of complex data, a lot of high throughput data, a lot of complex analyses, and it's actually fairly hard to go through a paper that's been published and check to see whether or not they have errors in their data or they have errors in their code or whether or not their tables and figures are really valid. So this is surprisingly hard uh, and some researchers in a 2009 paper in Nature Genetics illustrated this. They went through and tried to reproduce just a single table or figure from 18 published studies in Nature Genetics. These were all studies that involved microarray data, so these are gene expression signatures. Uh, Nature Genetics requires authors of that type of paper to make the data publicly available. So they went through these 18 papers, they really worked very hard to try to reproduce a table or a figure. Uh, they were only able to do it, even though all the data were available, they were only able to do it for two studies, just 11%, and they reproduced these only in principle, meaning that there were some slight differences from the published version. An additional six studies were partially reproduced with some discrepancies, and 10, the majority of studies, could not be reproduced at all. So this doesn't mean that the studies are wrong, that they have errors in them, but it means that they're completely uncheckable because nobody can even begin to address whether or not the data and the analyses were correct, whether there were errors in there, because nobody can reproduce the, the tables and figures. Nobody can recreate the analysis. So that's a real barrier. If you can't recreate the analysis, you can't check it. And that leads to, if you've got uncheckable research, uh, that leads to problems. That leads to uh, problems in, that I'm going to talk about in this next case study. So there was a uh, sort of a scandal over some cancer research at, at Duke that's been in the news of late. And I'll tell, give you a little bit of history on this. This involved some major errors in the data, um, in some complex data, and it made it to the published literature. And it happened to be that some statisticians tried to, to actually reproduce the, the method because it was so potentially impactful. So uh, basically some researchers at Duke published a, a series of papers starting in 2006 that, have, that introduced a new method for predicting patient response to cancer drugs. And it used publicly available data. So this was great because there, this is data that anybody could access to potentially use this method to find better drugs for cancer patients. And it was complex data, high throughput microarray gene signature data. Uh, the uh, finding was so impactful that it was named one of the top six genetic stories of 2006 by Discover Magazine. However, as I mentioned, some biostatisticians, Keith Baggerly and Kevin Coombs at MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, actually went to try to replicate their results. And the reason they did is because some oncologists, some cancer doctors at their institution came to them and said, wow, this is so important. We really want to replicate and be able to use this method ourselves. So they tried to replicate it and uh, they tried very hard to replicate it. It turns out that it was completely irre irreproducible, so um, the method actually didn't work. What Baggerly and Coombs uncovered when they really slewed, sleuthed, you know, did some sleuthing uh, in, this, um, in the data and in the analysis is they found all sorts of bookkeeping errors. So again, these were publicly available data, so they were able to take the same data that the Duke researchers used and try to recreate their analyses they found that there were some really simple but uh, very uh, problematic uh, problems in the data. So there had been some off by one errors introduced and these were probably introduced in Excel 
or a similar database program where you know you delete a part of a column or a part of a row and it shifts over a set of observations but not all of them so basically all of the observations get mixed up well that's huge because that now means that your data doesn't mean anything um, so that's a huge mistake in your data, but very easy to introduce in Excel. They also found that some of the labels of the drug sensitive versus drug resistant cells had been completely reversed. This is a major problem because remember we're trying to predict who's going to be sensitive to uh, drugs and who's going to be resistant to them. So if you predict the exact opposite, you're going to give everybody the exactly wrong drug for them. So these were major errors. Uh, Baggerly and Coombs went on to write a uh, uh, a letter to the editor of Nature Medicine, where the first uh, set of, uh, where the first publication on this ha had been published by the Duke authors. Uh, that letter to the editor was published, but then it was kind of that was it. Well, the the researchers at Duke kept publishing more on this method. Baggerly and Coombs now were kind of invested into continuing to keep uh, to sleuth uh, the, these papers, and. Um, they found errors in, in, in a number of other papers. When they corrected these errors, the method just no longer worked. It was no longer, it was a completely irreproducible uh, approach. So in other words, their method, their approach did not work if you analyze the data correctly. Um, and Baggerly and Coombs tried to bring up these criticisms um, and try to get people to listen to them. It turned out that it took them a while to get anybody to pay attention. In the meantime, the Duke researchers actually started using the approach to treat cancer patients in clinical trials. So this is really where um, it turned uh, you know, bad because now they're actually treating patients based on something that doesn't work. So um, Baggerly and Coombs tried to get uh, you know, somebody to listen to them. They finally got uh, a paper published on the whole subject in the Annals of Applied Statistics. That's uh, Bradley Efron's journal. I, t I interviewed him last week. And uh, that got some people interested. Um, but still, it was hard to get people to pay attention. What finally kind of broke up in the story was that um, somebody uh, identified that there had been um, a fraud, that the, the main researcher at Duke who had been responsible for these papers had lied on his CV about being a Rhodes Scholar. And that, uh, you know, if you talk about errors in the data, people's eyes glaze over, but you talk about somebody falsifying their, their CV, that got everybody paying attention. So the officials sort of finally took heed, shut down the trials at Duke. Um, the Duke researcher ended up resigning and now there's been uh, 10 papers retracted and another 8 corrected in the medical literature due to this. So this really uncovered a whole just set of um, errors in the literature, uh, probably some fraud as well. But it took Baggerly and Coombs uh, about 1,500 hours to do this sleuthing. So clearly this is not going to occur in most cases. These kinds of errors are going to go undetected unless we have research out there that is at least checkable. So that's why it's so important that, it, that you're able to even check the research to, to, um, to verify that there's no errors in the data and the analysis of this type. So, so uh, one of the journals, the, the, the Journal of Biostatistics, has actually appointed now a reproducibility editor to try to you know, uh, move this reproducible research movement forward. So for that journal, authors may actually requ request a reproducibility review. So that editor will actually rerun the code on the data to make sure that he can reproduce the, all of the papers, tables, and figures. And if he can, the paper gets a little flag with an R on it. It gets also a D because the data are available and C that the code are available. So, uh, so journals are trying to make some attempts to implement this. It's hard though. There are a lot of challenges in implementing this kind of, st uh, this kind of system. But that's where hopefully things are moving and um, uh, that's where a lot of journals hope to go. Uh, there are a n number of challenges, so it's unclear how journals can host all of this. How can you host all of the code and the different software potentially for all these different analyses, uh, host all the data, these major data sets? So how will that happen? Who will be in charge with running these reproducibility checks? They can take a really long time, even if you have the code and the data. So who's going to do that, if anyone? Uh, what if you've got proprietary data and software that you don't want to share? Uh, if you've got human subjects data, are there issues of privacy if you're making these data openly available? So there's a lot of challenges, uh, but people are really working on this and trying to come up with ways um, to be able to do reproducible research in, in some way. And certainly it has a lot of benefits. It improves transparency, uh, it uncovers mistakes such as those in the, in the Duke case. 
it prevents fraud, it prevents cherry picking, which is this idea that sometimes researchers will look at a particular part of their data, but maybe not look at the totality of their data and pick out just the data that uh, supports their hypotheses. Uh, reproducible research, of course, makes replication easier. That is independent replication, where an independent group can then go on and replicate those results. If you know exactly how uh, they analyze their data and how the method works, that makes that easier. It makes collaboration easier. In general, it makes uh, science progress faster. So there's really a lot of good reasons to uh, try to support this idea of reproducible research, and, and you probably will see a lot more of it in the future. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.